Thank you, thank you very much. And don't forget, this video was made possible by my patrons on Patreon. Want to support me? The link is on the screen. Sincerely yours, Visual Pony, and enjoy this audiobook. The Luna Cipher Chapter 13 As Brave as an Army with Banners There were, of course, banners and trumpets, and flags and confetti and bunting and streamers. As the seven of us marched out of the castle, the reflected glare of the morning sunlight off of our armor nearly blinded half the crowd, and the fanfare and the roar of the audience drowned out my little prepared speech. But all the ponies seemed to love it. Chrysalis hadn't wanted to be part of the ceremony and had boarded the airship well before dawn with her two changeling attendants. Fortunately, after I explained in detail how the expedition was supposed to turn out, one, Spike was satisfied with escorting the rest of us to even Star's Moorage and then remaining at home. He wore his shiny new breastplate and a hat with a big feather in it while carrying my personal banner as we headed for the airship. One, hours and hours of boredom punctuated by moments of appalling violence. We marched up to the airship's boarding ramp and took up our stations. Even Star lifted, trailing all of her signal flags and some unauthorized streamers, and we were away. Rainbow Dash and her team flew a V-formation in front of us, with other Pegasi teams flanking them. We turned in a broad curve until we were on a course that took us over the Ever Free, heading for our rendezvous point. Would you like to take the helm, your highness? Captain Zephyr asked. I had been standing on the bridge all the while, going over all the plans in my head while nervously tapping my metal shot hoofs on the deck. I suppose it was the captain's polite way of asking if I'd like to have something else to do but fret. It wasn't a bad idea. I usually found the slow, careful motions and steady concentration needed for steering an airship very relaxing. The pilot recited our course, speed and control setting and I repeated them back to him before I took the wheel. With the captain's tacit permission, I ran through a series of simple maneuvers. Even Star had been taken out for a shakedown and speed tests the day before, of course. I just wanted to make sure that I had the feel of the new way she handled. Aside from being a bit less responsive to the helm, she still steered well enough. Lieutenant Stormfeather went over the new levers and valves that had been installed on the pilot's pedestal with me. Even though most of them controlled systems that gave even star additional maneuvering capabilities, which were too uncomfortable or dangerous for a passenger ship, I made sure to memorize them. Twenty minutes or so later, a Manticore flapped up from the forest. It was probably just curious about us. I can't see how even one of the fierce creatures of the Everfree would think attacking a large craft like even Star would be a good idea. The Pegasi on our left flank dove at it and it fled back below the canopy of trees. Otherwise, not much happens the rest of the watch. I briefly looked in on every pony before making my way to my cabin and settling in. Before starting to work, I removed my chamfron and set it on the bed. I brushed out my mane, wishing Luna was there to do it for me, or even just to watch. Or just to be there. I wondered if every pony in the first flush of love was so obsessive about their partners, or it was just me. I sighed, put aside my pointless speculation and turned to my paperwork. First, I reread the replies to my letters to Shining Armor and Cadence. Cadence's was very polite, but still seemed a bit cool and distant, even though apologies had been exchanged and explanations made. I wrote her again, just directly laying out my feelings on the matter and giving her my love. 
I knew that a less direct approach was probably called for, but Periwinkle, who usually helped me with such things, wasn't aboard to turn my blunt phrases into a polite word dance. I'd get a chance to talk with Shining at the rendezvous, so I didn't bother replying to his somewhat fractured ramble about family and duty. At least he'd signed it, your BBBFF. I put the letter in the stack to be sent from Dodge Junction. I dealt with a few other bits of correspondence and went over a few reports, but it was mostly just busy work. I hadn't been lying to Spike about the amount of dragging downtime involved in any military endeavor. I finally admitted to myself that nobody would consider it dereliction of duty if I just relaxed with a good book. I discovered that the angled coronet that toppled my chamfron made an ideal book rest. It was late afternoon when a Pegasus courier came winging in from the northeast. He reported that Solar Flare was slightly ahead of schedule and would be at the rendezvous point a half hour early. I ordered our engines to full ahead and sent the messenger back with a note saying that we would try to arrive at the same time. I'd gone over the consumption projections several times and knew that the extra fuel that would be burned was well within our safety margin. Seeing Luna again a few moments sooner would absolutely be worth it. The two airships signaled each other, a series of colorful flags dropping on weighted lines from their respective bridges. They maneuvered and dropped their ground anchors well upwind to where Hazina was already waiting. I stood impatiently on Even Star's bridge until the all secure signal was given and then I threw myself out of the side hatch and sped for Solar Flare. Luna met me halfway. It's certainly possible to hug and smooch in mid-air, but not being a natural born Pegasus and encased in metal, I decided not to try it. But oh, how I wanted to. Instead, we flew tight circles around each other, calling out greetings. She was wearing her platinum armor, bright and shining again, and I felt dizzy at the sight of her magnificence. Or maybe it was a flying in circles. We finally got smart about it and I followed Luna back to Solar Flare. The commander's stateroom was quite nice and the bed was very comfortable. And strong. I had a nice talk with my brother and felt very good about it afterwards. We'd commiserated about having to balance official duties with our personal lives and agreed that the world ought to be much simpler than it actually was. We made tentative plans for a completely unofficial family get-together after everything was settled with the dark magic monsters. We needed a chance to correct the misunderstandings that threatened to become a rift. Shining and I then met with the rest of the fleet commanders before dinner and we went over the plan again. I assured them that Chrysalis's part was purely political and that, unless things went wrong in a completely unexpected and spectacular way, she would not be taking part in the fighting. Nobody came up with anything new and there was general agreement that everything was in order. Shining and Luna were being very polite to each other and that also added to my general satisfaction with the situation. Luna and I dined with officers and chrysalis, but retired just as soon as it was terribly rude to do so. It took a lot of effort on my part to wait even that long because Luna kept surreptitiously running her magic over my mane. When we made love that night, there was a moment when I looked up at the golden sun and splendor that crowned the headboard of the bed and recalled that there had been a time that such decorations were commonly called the Eye of Celestia. I froze up for a second. Oh, Twilight. Luna gasped. Cease not thy ministrations now, I beg of thee. I had an urge to flip a corner of the bed curtains over the sun, but mentally shook myself out of a pointless reaction to my ridiculous flash of guilt. I turned my magic back to pleasing my lover and was rewarded by a soft cry on a taken breath. 
That wordless sound of joy meant more to me than any praise of Celestia's I could imagine. I wandered in a beautiful village of whitewashed stone buildings that clung to a steep rocky shore. The same moonlight that sparkled on the ocean far below made the pale buildings and mosaic of luminescence and shadow. I climbed the winding streets, discovering delightful little plazas and fountains along the way, until I reached a great tower at the top of the village. Strings of colored lanterns hung around the edge of the open space at the foot of the towers as if they had been set out for a celebration, but there were no ponies present. On the tower itself hung a huge embroidered banner that stirred slightly in the gentle breeze from the sea. It depicted Luna, rampant against a field of stars. The artist had captured her beautifully, even though the design was stylized in a heraldic manner. While I was admiring the banner, I caught a movement out of the corner of my eye. A black patch of shadow at the foot of the tower was moving in a way that couldn't be accounted for by the slight swinging of the little lanterns. It slowly flowed out onto the plaza, oozing towards me like six spill of black oil. I cautiously stepped back and ready to spell. The unnatural shadow stopped inching towards me as if it realized it had been seen. Then it began to undulate and hump upward, drawing in its edges. It rose up into a distorted shape and I caught the brief glimpse of white within it like a parted mouth full of sharp fangs. Then two glowing dragon eyes opened in the blackness and the thing spoke. She is magnificent, isn't she? The nightmare slowly took on her usual shape and she nodded her head towards the banner, mane and tail streaming away from her like dense, oily smoke. My Luna is the most beautiful mare that has ever lived, I said, looking back up at the banner. You a Luna? The nightmare said, her eyes narrowing. Yes, and I'm her Twilight. I replied, just a bit miffed at her tone. Oh, I thought you belonged to the big white one. Her mouth quirked upward in a half grin, half sneer. Celestia's little terror is what some ponies call you. The vicious attack dog that keeps Her Majesty's hoofs out of the mud. I'm going to kill you, I told her conversationally. Not right now, but sometime soon. After all I've done for you? That seems ungracious. She didn't seem too upset by the news. I know you're up to something. There's a prophecy. She chuckled and trailed a wingtip along a string of lanterns as she walked, setting them to swinging. There's always a prophecy. Equestria is littered with them. Prophecy, destiny, fated quest and ancient enemy. They will tuck at you like the strings on a puppet if you let them. She leaned close to a red lantern and the dancing highlights in her eyes became blood-colored streaks. Let me guess, it was Celestia who told you about this prophecy? I tried to remain calm, but a tight rage was building up in my chest. Killing you seems like a better and better idea every time you open your mouth. I said through my teeth. Do your worst. She grinned. Afterwards, we'll sit down to tea and I can tell you what you did wrong. I faced much more powerful foes than you. Her smile faded. Only with borrowed power, Twilight. Alone, you are no match for me. I'm not alone. I have my friends. I have the rainbow power and I have Luna. Oh, yes. The nightmare's grin returned. The lovely Luna. Where is she, I wonder? That was a very good question. I glanced up at the banner and touched my lower lip with my teeth. She would rush to your defense if she sensed the slightest threat to you, wouldn't she? The nightmare almost purred the words. So I must not be a threat. Isn't that logical? I wish I could believe that. 
Where was Luna? That little tidbit of advice I gave you some nights ago served you well, didn't it? She began to circle me, walking very slowly and only looking at me from the corners of her half-lidded eyes. If we were friends, I could show you other things. Things that would make that seem like nothing in comparison. She circled closer, her smoky tail curving around just a hoof span from my legs. We could practice them together. Get away from me! The nightmare swirled away into a cloud of laughter and smoke, then reformed into her eloquent shape at a more comfortable distance. As you wish, Twilight. You see, I am very accommodating. That said, she began walking towards me again. It felt like I was being stalked by a predator. You are chummy with Discord. You play ball with Cerberus. You are even getting along quite well with the parasites that came close to devouring all of Canterlot. Why shouldn't we be friends? Because killing you will save Celestia. Perhaps, perhaps not. You could be misinterpreting the prophecy. Or, like several others, it could be wrong. Or Celestia may have lied to you. Shut up! I screamed. Shut up, shut up, shut up! The big banner loudly snapped in the rising wind, and the figure of Luna tore loose from it and fell in serpentine twists to the paving stones. It didn't land in a heap the way fabric ought to have done, but stood there, looming above the nightmare. Enough! Embroidered Luna snarled at her. Go now, else we shall do battle. I am stronger than you. The nightmare said. I once was. I am not alone. Luna said, laying a fabric wing across my back. No, you are not alone now. But there are great changes coming. The nightmare said over the freshening breeze. Changes that may tear you two apart. Apart you will be no threat to me. The wind increased, swinging the strings of lanterns wildly. One line broke and the brass and colored glass smashed on the paving stones, the candles guttering out. Luna pulled me closer. We will never leave each other! I yelled at the nightmare over the rising gale. The wind tore at the nightmare's form, shredding it and carrying it away into the darkness. But I clearly heard her last words, anyway, and they didn't please me at all. Never is a long time, mortal. I'm going to kill her so hard, she's going to bounce! I growled as I paced around Luna's state room in the morning. Then I'm going to find and use a resurrection spell on her just so I can kill her again! Luna didn't interrupt. She just sat on the bed and watched me pace. At one point, she tilted her head and smiled. What are you grinning at? Don't you think I mean it? Ah, but of course you do, my love. I revel in thy righteous anger. But also, I cannot help but notice. Was she actually blushing? It was kind of hard to tell under her dark coat. What? Thou art developing the most attractive lines of muscle tone in thy shoulders and thighs. The wearing of armor agrees with you, it seems. Well, that totally derailed my rant. Around an hour or so later, I showered and left her stateroom, heading back to my own ship. I was still feeling the golden afterglow and was so distracted by my own happy thoughts that I almost ran into Private Flicker. Not that I realized who he was until he spoke. Your Highness, he said, bowing low. I wish to thank you again. His half armor let me see his cutie mark, which was the same open fan, but it was a much darker shade of orange than before, and it had a small crescent moon on top of it. It fit quite well against his new steel gray coat. You're welcome. How are you adjusting? I did not understand before what an honor and a blessing it is to serve Her Majesty of the Night. 
Had I known, I would have volunteered before I was wounded. Oh, so he was adjusting pretty well, it seemed. How about your family and friends? He shrugged. They are fearful, but I hope they will come to accept it. In any case, the night guard is a family to me now. Maybe Flicker was adjusting a little too well. I might have been more concerned, except I was halfway to worshipping Luna myself. I completely understood his enthusiasm. I flew over to Even Star and made sure everything was ready for the next leg of the trip. Then I stopped by the galley to get some breakfast and found Rainbow Dash slurping down a big bowl of oats and cream. Oh hey, Twy! She greeted me, lifting her dripping muzzle out of the bowl for just a second. By the time I got my food and went to sit down at the table, Dash had finished and was moving to the door. Hang on a second, Rainbow. Yeah? She stopped and looked back. I just wanted to ask you something. Just saying, shoot! She stood up a little straighter, no doubt anticipating a grilling on the progress of her own recovery. How are your teammates coming along? Dash relaxed a bit and gave a little shrug of one shoulder. Not too bad, actually. I'm keeping it really simple for Downer, and Depri is never going to be a star formation flyer, but they're doing okay. They're sure trying really hard. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you, Rainbow. No prop, Twy. Make sure you and your team get some rest today. You'll be wrangling clouds in the middle of the night tonight. Rainbow Dash blew me a raspberry. Twy, the day you can teach me anything about napping is the day I turn in my wings. The rest of the day was hard on me. I tried to sleep in the afternoon, but only managed a bit less than an hour. I kept feeling like there was a lunar-shaped hole by my side. The courier said flew circuit between the ships carried some saucy notes between us, but that was all I had to occupy my time. I teleported out to Hazina a couple of times, unnecessarily checking on her cargo and her skeleton crew. We all knew what we had to do and all the preparations had been made, so there was not much else to do but watch the desert slide by beneath us until we were in position. When night finally fell, things started to happen. All three airships hove to at predetermined distances and then the weather pegasi got busy. Luna and I provided extra energy for the steaming machinery on Solar Flare's flight deck, while the cloud specialists came and went. About two hours before dawn, I flew out and inspected the line. The fluff pushers, too, certainly knew their business. We had a perfectly natural looking line of high desert columns in place. I returned to Solar Flare as the second shift Pegasi moved into position to start the gentle breeze that would float us over our target. 2. Not a pejorative, that's what they call themselves. When I staggered slightly on landing, Luna insisted on putting me into a brief magical sleep. I awoke refreshed and energetic, and she gave me a lingering kiss before I left for even star. Be careful, beloved. Any hurt you take will pain me twice as much. There will be plenty of hurt, but it will all be outgoing, I promise you. I love thee with a fierce and lasting passion, Twilight Sparkle. I returned her kiss, then said, Thou art my true and noble lady, Luna. My steel and velvet lady of the night. I tore myself away from her and flew through the darkness to even star where she waited, far below. It was time to go to war. The clouds floating in the arid desert sky lit up in red and orange hues minutes before the light of the sun touched the ground around the entrances to the changeling hive. When the sun was fully risen, there still remained dark shadows across the landscape. Shadows that crawled and slithered and even walked. As even star floated slowly nearer, I could make out the shadow sinks digging at the ground in several places, scraping away with claws and teeth at the hard translucent substance that plucked the entrance to the hive. 
where the sun was at a particular angle, vague movement could be seen through the greenish plaques as the changelings on the inside presumably added to them, fighting a slow battle against the diggers. I lowered the spyglass and nodded to Captain Zephyr. It's all just as General Cherry reported. We go ahead as planned. The captain saluted me and then pulled down three times on a large brass lever that had been newly installed on the aft bulkhead of the bridge. I could hear bells ringing throughout the ship and hoofs clattering on the deck. It wasn't at all like the scenes you might read in military novels, with all the excited shouting of battle stations and ponies rushing around in near panic. All my crew knew exactly where they needed to be and they went to their places with a minimum of fuss. Two unicorns entered the bridge and set themselves at their firing ports. They flipped the brass levers that opened the ports and then slid their heads into the padded rests that supported them while their horns projected slightly beyond the hull. We cleared the last ridge between us and the hive. If the monsters happened to look in the right direction, they would undoubtedly see us. One of the speaking tubes whistled. Lieutenant Stormfeather flipped up the cover and put his ear to the tube. After a moment, he flipped the cover down again and turned to the captain. All crew at battle stations, sir. Very good, lieutenant. Start engines and get us some altitude. The pilot set the two trim tabs to either side of the wheel and then adjusted three small ballast tank valves and pulled the dump lever. There was a clunk and a hiss and the deck pressed against my hoofs as the water dropped away and even star began to rise. The lieutenant rang the big handles of the engine telegraph to slow ahead and moments later the indicators matched up and the low rumble of the engines accompanied a surge forward. I raised my glass and saw the sudden flurry of movement in the mass of monsters as I heard our engines start up. Black shapes began to rise into the sky. Looks like they've gotten better at flying since last time, the lieutenant observed. He was right. There was none of the floundering, inefficient motion we had encountered in the first battle. The mass of monsters still seemed slightly disorganized, but the individuals flew very well. Quite a lot of them looked like changelings. Full ahead, the captain said quietly. Lieutenant Stormfeather rang for the requested speed and the indicators acknowledged his order. The engines ramped up, moving us faster and faster towards the monsters. The creatures began to realize we were a serious threat and some broke away from the mass to charge at us while the rest of the flight-capable monsters were still taking to the air. I could spare firepower for the first few brave, or stupid, once and I settled myself into the central firing port. Monsters fled brightly and fell from the sky as we opened up on them. Far from being a discouragement to the rest, the initial blasts seemed to galvanize all of the remaining flyers and they came at us en masse. Even the few left on the ground decided to take to the air. They weren't stupid about it either. They rose as quickly as possible to get above even Star's envelope, where only the three unicorns and the dorsal copula would be able to fire at them. We kept firing at the approaching flyers from the bridge and the pots along the gondola's sides until there were no more targets visible to us. A whistle from a speaking tube and the lieutenant opened it and listened, repeating the reports as he heard it. Enemy massing above. Tight formation. Any second now. They're going to hit us all at once. I stood and nodded. Time to go! In a flash of magic, I was on Solar Flare's bridge, standing in front of Luna. Now! I sat and couldn't resist kissing her on the end of her nose, just below the edge of her chamfron. I heard vent gas and engines full ahead before I winked out again. Back on Even Star, we all slipped on our dark glass goggles and I moved on the speaking tube from the copula. I heard some muffled thumps as the most eager of the monsters hit the envelope topside, then several more in quick succession. Then the hollow voice of Captain Lightning Lance shouting, Now, Princess! I cast a shield around Even Star. It was an ellipsoid rather than a sphere, a compromise between fitting it as closely to the airship's shape as possible while keeping the math simple enough for me to maintain in my head. 
that still left a number of early arrivals clinging to us inside the energy barrier, but it excluded the majority of the monsters assaulting us. Those were still outside. Where Solar Flare was. High above us, one of the big, fluffy and totally non-threatening columns of clouds that had drifted over the hive in the wee hours of the night, burst open to reveal the enormous airship that had been hidden within. She dropped down, trailing thick wisps of clouds as her firing ports flickered open. I saw her rudders swing hard left as she turned to present us with her starboard side, and then I didn't see much else but blazing magical fire as she enveloped us with a full broadside. The pressure in my head as I took the strain of the impacts on my shield was worse than I anticipated, but I managed to keep the shield firm even as a kinetic transfer made even Star lurch and slew around. The plan had been for 10 second bursts, repeated until all the monsters outside the shield were destroyed, but I could have sworn that the first volley went on for at least a minute. When the barrage finally let up, I widened my stance and lowered my head, bracing for the next attack. I needn't have bothered. The next blasts from Solar Flare were sporadic and specifically targeted, hardly impacting my shield at all. After about a minute of that, all firing stopped and a string of signal flags dropped from Solar Flare's bridge. Solar Flare reports all our aerial targets destroyed, your highness, Lieutenant Stormfeather said. I dropped my shield and flipped open the speaking tube to the bunk rooms. All packets are away! I shouted. Our small contingent of Pegasi flung themselves out of the hatches and began engaging the monsters that had been inside our shield. The unicorns fired at any lone dark shape they saw, but most of those were already broken creatures spiraling down to the desert below. Solar Flare, meanwhile, kept dropping down towards the hive, her unicorns turning their attention to the flightless groundlings, which were helpless without their air cover. It was an out-and-out out massacre. We sent out messengers to the Wonderbolt's picked line to the east where they had positioned themselves between the hives and the city, patrolling for any SKPs that might carry news to the main body of the monsters. They reported no sightings at all. The battle was officially over. I went aft to tell Chrysalis that it was safe to leave the ship and found that she and her attendants had joined even Star's Pegasi in the cleanup action. The spatters of green goo looked perfectly natural on her. It's all clear, your majesty. You can go tell your people the siege has been lifted. She paused before she jumped out of the open hatch and said, Thank you, Twilight Sparkle. She said it like she had something sour in her mouth, but she said it. The girls were also there, even Rainbow Dash who had just arrived back from her scouting flight. I grinned at them, feeling very pleased with myself. I think that may be the first time in history a battle has gone exactly as planned. Applejack chuckled and lifted a leg, shaking it so that her armor rattled. All rush up and nobody to stop. Dumping isn't the most important part of it, AJ. Dash said with a superior air, much to the surprise of every pony present. We had more trouble with the Paris Sprites. Rarity said, sounding just a little miffed. A Pegasus entered the hatch while we were talking and Fluttershy turned towards him. Are you hurt? Do you need medical attention? Oh, no ma'am, I'm fine. Oh, said Fluttershy, sounding both apologetic and disappointed at the same time. Do you know if any pony else is hurt? I think one of the unicorns in the copula got cut by some broken glass when the firing pot cracked. Fluttershy grabbed the first aid kit and ran into the passageway. Pinkie Pie was pressed against one of the ports, looking intently down at the desert below. She had a pencil tucked into the corner of her mouth and would turn aside every so often and scribble something on a pad that lay on the deck. What are you doing, Pinkie? I asked her. Baking! She mumbled around the pencil. Eh, uh, no you're not. I said, intrigued despite myself. What's on the pad? I moved closer to get a look at her writing or drawing or whatever it was. But she snatched up the pad and held it close to her chest. Professional secret! 
She hissed at me with narrowed eyes and then rushed out of the room. I shrugged and let it go. A couple of minutes later, as I was speaking to a young unicorn who had a band-aid on his cheek that was padded with pink and blue kittens, two changelings crawled in the open hatches. Her Majesty requires your presence, the first one demanded of me. Shut up, you idiot! The second snapped at her, giving her a hoof to the shoulder. I'm sorry, Princess Twilight, she continued. But could you please come down to the hive? It's urgent. Tell Captain Zephyr where I've gone, please, I said to Applejack and then dove out of the hatch after the changelings. We dropped down to one of the hive's entrances and I could see right away that it hadn't been opened willingly. The mouth of the tunnel was littered with the bodies of both monsters and changelings. This way, your highness. I followed the changelings down into the dark. Author's Note Pre-readers hold great power, and with great power comes great nachos. No, really, academic pony institutes need to go treat themselves to some awesome nachos or poutine or something. They should smugly celebrate with unhealthy yummy snacks their ability to make me rewrite big chunks of text with but an offhand note. Common time, every pony. So, yeah, as always, I will remind you that you can support me via my Patreon. The link is in the description, as always. And now let's get to what I have to say about this chapter, because there are some things I have to do. I'm early in the morning right now, and, uh, yeah, basically started recording this right after I got up. So, I excuse, please excuse it if there are some parts that sound like I'm falling asleep. But, yeah, you get where I'm going with this. So, uh, we see the start of the operation here, and it's pretty interesting to see that, um, yeah, that, that one part where Twilight and Luna are on, uh, first of all, when they are separated, and then when um, even Star catches up with uh, Solar Flare, and they are flying in circles around each other in the, b between the ships. I mean, I was a soldier on either of those ships. I would, uh, it was like going past the window and looking out and see my two commanders flying in circles around each other. I would be like, okay, what the fuck was in my breakfast? Yeah, you know, just like, uh, okay. <laughs> Why don't they just decide on one ship and, you know, land? It's like that age-old question. My place or your place? So, uh, yeah, so they go at it again. This time in Solar Flare's... Uh, yeah, in basically, if you think about it, they do it in Celestia's bed. Because that room is... A, I, I, I guess it's a, a... It's a room of the commander of the vessel, so... And uh, since I think that usually Celestia commands that ship, um, they're doing it in Celestia's bed. What the fuck? I mean, okay, why not? Um, yeah. And then we have Twilight's battle plan here, with uh, even Star, Solar Flare, and Hazina being um, disguised by clouds, and then being floated over the desert, over the hive. So, uh, and then even Star begins the attack. Yeah. And Solar Flare basically uh, starts shooting at even Star after Twilight has put up a shield. Oh, wow. That could have gone so wrong. That could have gone so wrong. I mean, okay. Twilight is a very uh, capable alicorn, a very capable mare. But. We see here in this chapter that there is a firing port where she got into. So what if Luna had started to fire? Um, just imagine, like, I don't know, 50 unicorns and Luna firing at the monsters in one big volley. I don't think that uh, Twilight would have been able to hold up that shield, especially since she 
um, already describes that holding the shield was harder than she expected. And uh, mixed that with Luna's power, oh my god, even Star would have been turned to dust. So, yeah. I think uh, maybe it was arranged that Luna would not join the attack just because of that. Or maybe uh, Luna did join in the attack but held back. Who knows? It's not explained here. What I also liked was uh, that that plan, actu plan actually worked. I mean, it was a good plan. She used even Star as a, uh, as a decoy. And then Solar Flare used her superior firepower to take out the monsters. If Twilight had tried something like she had on her first encounter with those monsters, like, yeah, just going with even Star, a small complement of um, soldiers and a contingent of soldiers and Luna, I think that could have turned out into a massacre. But Solar Flare. Wow. Uh, we'll see if that ship will live up to its name. So far it certainly has. And let's just, just hope that Twilight doesn't, uh, well, plan on using her as a decoy any more than necessary, because I think that could seriously go wrong. Yeah, I mean, even if she's an alicorn, there are limits to her power. Um, not to forget, they have Solar Flare with them. Solar Flare is one big fucking airship. So, yeah. Um, what else? Yeah, I liked the part that Chrysalis actually um, didn't sit by, but helped with the cleanup operation and and later thanked Twilight. That was a nice, nice little tidbit. I mean, I of course know already where this is going. But you'll be quite surprised next week. That much I can tell you. Um, what else? What else? What else? Ah, oh, man, there was something else. Ah, yes, and I hope that Twilight gets to catch some sleep because I personally yesterday, oh my god, the night before, um, yesterday I got like only two hours of sleep. I don't know why. I just was rolling around in bed and couldn't. Uh, and then yesterday I was like, uh, like walking like a zombie. Uh, totally. I, I just went through the motions of my chores and then sat down and fell asleep. I, uh, so basically I hope she gets some sleep because she has another battle coming and this one will be much bigger. I mean... Right now, she has only f uh, destroyed a force that was sieging the hive. And there is still the place where they are getting out, so, or where they are appearing. And I can only assume that the majority of the monster's force will be there. So Twilight gets some fucking sleep. Sincerely, US Visual Pony, let me know what you think about this. And we will hear of each other next chapter.